Hello and welcome to our weekly Parsha Shear with the commentary of the Al Shakush. This Parsha Shlach Lechol. We're out of joint, incidentally, with Israel. So if you're watching this in, in Eretz Israel, I'm afraid it's not Parsha uh, Shlach Lechol for you, and I've very little I can do about that. Anyway, I still hope if you're watching there, for those of you who are watching there, because I know there are some, uh, that you're still enjoying the Shear. Uh, as you know, for the last little while we've been davening for uh, two people. Uh, the first one is a little boy who's waiting for a transplant, Aurea Chaim ben Chana Yehudis, and we should still be davening for that. They're still waiting for a transplant that he needs, and he should have that, and he should have a first name. But the other person we've been davening for is Ro Chai ben Sora. And I'm very um, happy to tell you there's good news in that front. Um, he has uh, had a, a, some really good news. Scans are showing very, very encouraging uh, results. Uh, fears that the doctors had uh, have not been realized. Uh, you and I know that our tefillahs and learning for the people we learn for and dabbling for the people we, we daven for always has an effect. Not always the one we were looking for, but it always has an effect. I was uh, very, very fortunate and blessed in my life to be close to the Manchester Rosh Shiva, Rasigal Zakatsadik Kodesh Libraka. And sometimes I would go to him with issues and problems. And he always used to say to me, Yehuda Yoina, come back and tell me if my brocha worked. Uh, because all the time you hear sad stories, terrible stories. Um, and we struggle with that. Everybody does. And, uh, however, when you hear that your, your feelings did work, did play a part, and things have worked out nicely, there's nothing better than hearing that you, um, and me all paid a little bit in Rafael Khan getting good news this week. I can't tell you how pleased I am about that. I'm very close to this young man. As I wrote to him in my text, I'm not over the moon. I'm heading for Jupiter. I've managed to get back for this year. Anyway, so which they both should continue to have progress and for all the other people um, who we know, we all know that are not well, um, and you can answer Romain at that point, uh, at this point, they should have a refuge. Shalima. If you would like to dedicate the year, and it's not a huge amount of money, um, then please let me know at yy at askrabbiyy.com. Um, and we could dedicate this year for somebody's reflection or, or to celebrate somebody's simcha or any other good Jewish reason. So please uh, uh, think of supporting our little uh, Alshach's year because um, uh, it's nice to put this out. And uh, yeah, encouragement is always, good, always useful. Fine. So there is so much to say in the Pasha of Shlach Lecho. It is the second, I think you could argue, most dramatic uh, Pasha in the whole of the Torah. It's the second massive failure of the Jewish people. The first, of course, is making the Egil Azov. The second is the spies bringing back a bad report about the land of Israel. I've discussed this intensively um, uh, over the, the last year's uh, series. But uh, we, where there's an aspect of it which I haven't gone into um, in this year, uh, in this forum, and I'd like to do that now. And that's what's one of the things they say when they come back. So let's just grab our, our little uh, art scroll. Well, yours might be a big art scroll, Chumash. And if you turn to make easy page 802, for those of you who are using other Chumashim, um, it's chapter Yud Gimel, and we're going to be looking at Lamed Base. And um, for those of you who've got neither, it doesn't matter. You just have to listen a wee bit more carefully uh, as we just set the scene of what we're going to be discussing. So here we go. Uh, the, the spies have come back. They've reported accurately and truthfully. They don't make anything up. That's part of the problem with the spies report. They don't actually say anything bad about the land of Israel, or rather nothing bad that uh, wasn't um, a fair representation of what they saw at least from their point of view. And therefore the real question is, why did they get into such trouble? Why was it such a disaster? And I suppose we're going to be touching on that in just a second. However, let's just set the scene. They come back, they say terrible things, and then Kolev stands up and comes to the defense of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, the Jewish, the honor of the Jewish people, their ability to take this land. And of course, ultimately Hashem himself, as we mostly shortly, but let's just read the Pesukim. So we're at Lamed Beis, and it says, but Yotzadibas Oretz, and they spoke, no, I'm trying to remember how they translate that in, in Art Scroll. So let's see, Lamed Base, and they brought, is it? Uh, um, 
The slandered is the usual way they translate that. Why am I not finding this? The Yom Sidi Besahora, it's Lama Beis, should be easy to find, 32. They brought forth to the children of Israel an evil report. An evil report. Okay, watch the Deba Sa'aras about the land of Israel. And the Yossi Deba Sa'aras Asher Torah Isol, which they had toured, El Bnei Israel back to the Jewish people. Lemar, and they said to them, Ha'ores Asher Avarno Bo Lasur, the land that we pay, we just passed through to tour, or to spy on, I suppose. Ha'ores um, Ochleho Yoshveho. It consumes, it eats its inhabitants. Now, Rashi points out that indeed it did. Hashem made lots of people die at that point so that the inhabitants of the land of Canaan would be busy burying them and therefore not notice these Jewish spies. But even though there was, you know, the, there's a way to look at something positively and a way to look at negatively, and they look at it, looked at it negatively and didn't see that perhaps that's what really was going on. Um, he, and everybody we saw there were anshimidos, men of stature. Now the word midos rings a bell. It's used uh, in uh, many, many times with regards to large people like Goliath. When he is called a man of mida, a man of stature, he was 18 feet tall. I meant, and I'm kicking myself, I meant to look this up before um, to see what was the height of the tallest man in whoever lived. Well, there's a picture I saw some, at some point of him standing next to a normal person. He was at twice the height of the normal person, of course, probably guessing that they had a quite small looking uh, normal person just to exaggerate the height difference. But I can't remember how tall he is. I am six foot one, so it was three Rubensteins standing on each shoulder, and that was Goliath. That's very, very big. I would not like to pick a fight with somebody that size, but David Amelech, who's much smaller than six foot one, uh, he was quite happy to do so. And that's going to be something to bear in mind. However, uh, they were big. So the people who were there were big. We're talking about your average Canaanite person was big. Okay. Um, so it seems to be the land, instead of killing its inhabitants, actually grew enormous inhabitants. Can't resist telling you that when I used to be the student chaplain for Manchester, um, at the beginning of my career there, I think that's 33 years ago, there was a Holocaust commemoration uh, event that had in the shul, which I eventually became the rabbi of, Wilbraham Road Synagogue, south of Manchester Synagogue. And there was a young, uh, a young God, the opposite, a very, an old couple who were Holocaust survivors and Lithuanian Jews. And uh, they had come to give a talk. I heard many such talks in those days. And uh, Lithuanian Jews, um, incidentally, if you ask my son, who is very, very big in our uh, mishpachology, our family tree, then um, the family uh, comes from, chiefly comes from Lithuania. Lithuanian Jews were tiny people. Uh, the diet was poor before the Second World War, or right after the Second World War, the height of your average Japanese person grew exponentially because they started eating a European-based diet, wheat instead of rice, and people grew, grew in, in height. Similarly, Lithuanians are quite small. Strange to note that when I started lecturing in South Africa, and almost every South African Jew is of Lithuanian origins, they're enormous. And when I was, it used to be brought in to speak for, uh, chiefly for uh, Orsamech, when I dove in Orsamech, there was Stenders, you know, little lecterns, table lecterns that people could put the sorum on. And literally, they were up to my chin. People were huge. And they were Lithuanian Jews. In just two generations, they were huge, much bigger than my near six foot one. But they were the average person there, the turret insists, were very, very tall people, much taller than the Jews, right? And if you're going to fight with people like that, that's significant. People take that into consideration. Uh, the, the raw data suggests that somebody of bigger body mass, bigger stature, is generally going to win a fight with somebody smaller, no matter what Hollywood wants to say. Anyway, so basically that's, it, it says they were all of great stature. Um, and then the next Bosik says, not only that, that, if we can find the place now, um, and to meet us, the Shomra Ines and Aphelin, and not only did we see huge human beings, we saw in the feeling these were, so it's actually the angels who fell to earth way back in the beginning of Bracious God uh, said to the angels, do you think you do a better job than, than the human beings? <laughs> Easy. And he put them down here in human form, but they were real giants. Now we're talking way off the scale. B'nai Onuk, the sons of Anak, mean and feeling from these fallen angels. B'nai Enenu, and they were, uh, sorry, Benihi, and we were in our eyes, like grasshoppers. That's nice. 
uh, and so we were in their eyes as well. That's what we're going to be looking at in this week's Parsha. This says the Kotzkarebi. I noticed this at the, the note at the bottom of the art scroll today, and saying I'm always quoting the art scroll and then pointing out the Alshrek disagrees with the translation. Um, I, although I keep saying I think it's a fabulous work. Having said that, I will read to you and honor the art scroll by reading what it says here. The Rebbe of Kotz commented that this declaration was the root of the spy's sin. That's the we were in our eyes. Um, um, like grasshoppers. And we, in our eyes too, were like grasshoppers. Okay, the Rebbe of Kotz commented, this declaration was the root of the spy's sin. They had no right to consider how the giants viewed them as Jews and emissaries of the Jewish people. They should have thought only of the mission, not what anybody thought of them. Hmm. Interesting. And I think that is a very, very important point. I saw a, a Risaka friend in the Art Scrolls um, free handout they give in show, um, which is very clever marketing, by the way. I don't know if you got them in your show. They have extracts of their new books. And a Risaka friend, who is a wonderful Tom Kochen, one of, the, one of the, the big ribonim of our generation, he says something very, very interesting. Again, the Possek says that we were, I'll read it to you so that we, I cannot be accused of getting it wrong. Um, so they bring out a bad report about the land of Israel. And then it says, uh, yep, uh, we saw the giants, and we were in our own eyes, and so we were in their eyes. But Rabbi Fran suggests maybe it's the other way about. Maybe we were small in our eyes because we were, maybe we were grasshoppers, tiny in our eyes, because we were tiny in their eyes. Now that's a very, very interesting insight. This is Drush. That's not what the Possek says, not the order of the Possek. But when it comes to Drush, implication, uh, lessons you can deduce from the Possek, there's a lot of elasticity. And uh, even though that might have to be a little bit elastic with the, with the Rabbi Franz Pshat and explanation, I still think it's an extremely valid one. Uh, that is to say that the way that people view us is so often the way we come to view ourselves. Um, I think I've mentioned this to you before. We, we've talked before about Stockholm Syndrome. In the 1970s, when international terrorism became a multi-million uh, uh, dollar uh, industry, usually Palestinian-led, then when this occurred, it was, it was the case that people who had been taken captive by terrorists, sometimes subjected to mock executions, which of course tremendously potent and horrible form of psychological uh, torture when you put lined up against the wall and people aim Kalashnikovs at you and pull the trigger, but the magazine's empty. Um, and sometimes real executions, which you had to watch their fellow captives being executed. The strange thing was, that when people arrived, people, when special forces arrived of the SES, Special Air Service, I think that's called, in England, uh, commandos, Navy SEALs, these sorts of people, um, elite forces to liberate and save uh, the, the captives. The strange thing was that they were found to be protecting and hiding the people who just a few minutes before were threatening to blow their heads off. Um, it's called Stockholm Syndrome. Or it, was that, it became diagnosed as a human condition, Stockholm Syndrome. And Stockholm Syndrome is that when you're in a terrible situation of oppression um, and cruelty, um, torture effectively, then the human condition is to reject that completely is to drive yourself insane. So if you can justify it and say what's happening to you is justified, you deserve it. Uh, then it makes it not so painful what you're going through, no matter how painful it is. Stockholm Syndrome, something we're all familiar with. If you ever walk in a, a forest and you see, or maybe even in the street, there's a tree growing there and somebody has carved their initials as young people like to do, you know, a heart shape and then BH loves, uh, DG, whatever it is. Um, sometimes the, the, the carving, the, the, the shape is the lines have been stretched because this carving was done when it was a small tree when it was a new tree when it was a sapling um, and as it has grown so too has the scar and it's become stretched um, and that's so very true about this idea of Stockholm syndrome that what people say to you and the vision people give to you which is negative and cruel think of 
you know, the school playground, which is often a place of intense cruelty. I saw just a quote recently, children are innocent. Somebody said, yes, of course children are innocent. Doesn't mean say they're nice. Hmm. Anyway, so basically a, the scars that you get, the things that people tell you about yourself, which are cruel, when you're young, very often grow with you and remain scars that grow as you grow all through your entire life. So here, Rabbi Fan says something which is tremendously interesting. He turns around and says, you know what? Maybe it's because they saw the Jews. Oh, the Jews knew that they saw us as Chagovim, as grasshoppers, tiny creatures. That's how we saw ourselves. We came to see ourselves. That's a very, very interesting idea. When Jews no longer believe in themselves, then they're in big trouble. And we, of course, as I said before, this is the second center when the Jewish people are in big trouble. There was an American philosopher, philosopher called Will Durant, and I only discovered today in preparing uh, the material for this year, um, that Will Durant actually, who was not Jewish, Catholic fellow, very brilliant mind, married to a Ukrainian Jewish woman, on the part of the Russian Empire. Um, and of course, Mr. Putin would like to be again. Uh, but basically, one of the two, this quote I'm about to repeat to you is uh, attributed to both of them. Well, they probably both used it. It'd be very hard to know which one come up with the first, but no great civilization is destroyed from without until it's first destroyed itself from within. Very interesting. When you stop believing in yourself, that's when you're vulnerable. That's when they can get you. But why could they possibly stop believing in themselves? Why did they stop believing in themselves and see themselves through the eyes of their enemies of the non-Jewish world, of a world that hates Jews and all that we stand for? When did, why and how could they come to see themselves like that? Let's look to the Anshach. Um, and he says it starts way, way back. Um, and it starts back at the beginning of the Parsha. You can see it starts back at the beginning of the Parsha because they want to send spies. Why do they want to send spies? Well, the answer is really quite simple. And we have to read that. So let's say, Send for yourself spies for Yusurus, Eretz Canaan, and those by the land of Canaan, a share Anina, send of the Israel, which I'm giving to the Jewish people. Each one from their father's house, each one that has a, a prince should send spies. And Rashi explains this is not Hashem giving a commandment, it's reacting to a request. The Jewish people came to Moshe, they said, we need to send spies. They had a rationale. On hearing that we're approaching the land of Israel, which is a gift by God to us, they'll want to hide away all the treasures and we won't know where they're hidden them. So therefore, if we go in and spy and find out where they keep all this stuff, then we will be able to, uh, uh, to get it when we come. And they've got all sorts of reasonable um, rationales for wanting to go and uh, to spy at the land of Israel, but really deep in their heart, uh, they didn't. They were scared of taking in the land of Israel. And I should say that Rahim Friedlander says in his wonderful Sefer Sifsi Chaim that the, the kings of Canaan, the land of Canaan, wives of Nod, conquered by this great massive uh, place called Egypt, the Jewish people had just left, the most powerful empire in the world at the time, because they were more powerful than Egypt. And more powerful doesn't just mean uh, militarily, it means in their, the structure of their society and their ability to manipulate occult forces something we've talked again in our sharing before, um, of what is is truly the ab ability to uh, manipulate occult forces uh, to do is astonishing things that we just can't quite understand. If, as Rabbi Desta points out, Hashem himself had to pass over uh, the houses of the Jews in Egypt because had he sent an angel, the Egyptians with their abilities, their mystical abilities could have shot down like the Iron Dome in Israel, uh, these in, this angel going across, it had to be Hashem himself. That gives you a taste of how uh, potent these forces were in the world at that time. And that was Egypt. Canaan was even greater. So you can understand that they are indeed being they are afraid. But let me tell you something I told you last year. This is a little extract. I think we used this in last year's share. But this is a, a beautiful Alshech. Remember, the Alshech is looking for anything that doesn't belong in the Posuk or something which is blatantly obvious, and therefore it's got no justification for being repeated again. And so uh, here's an obvious example, Posuk 2. Shlach l'chon anoshim sent to yourself men, for Yisurus, Eretz Canaan, will aspire the land of Canaan, Ashir, Ani, Noisen, which I am giving to Klaus Israel. 
So the Al Shuk is intrigued why it says this, because we all know, don't we know the land of Israel is the land which Hashem is giving to Cloud and Israel? Um, I mean, it's not Texas, it's not Argentina. Of course, it's the land of Israel. So why does it have to say that? So the Al Shuk says, because it's emphasizing that God's doing the giving. And you know, I say this in the present tense. I'm giving it to you now. And it's intriguing to think, he says, the quality of a gift depends on two factors, the giver and the getter, the person doing the giving, the person doing the receiving. So it's just been the 70th anniversary of Her Majesty the Queen, bless her, um, 70th anniversary of her being the queen on the throne in 1952, if I remember rightly, um, was when she became queen. Um, but it was an enormous celebration. And when the queen, now she's 96, I remember correctly, uh, when she used to go around the world on tours, when you visit a country, then of course they would bring her a gift. And it would usually be something extremely historically significant, an antique of some sort, certainly very valuable. Um, they certainly wouldn't give her, you know, um, a gift voucher for Macy's or Marks and Spencer's um, because she's the queen. So the quality of the gift um, that's going to depend on who's getting the gift and also who's giving the gift. Because when the queen herself gives a gift, because she is the queen, she can't give any old schmatter. It's got to be something which is, you know, uh, worthy of her. So there's two factors. Now, why are the Jewish people scared? They're scared because either because perhaps they think the land of Israel is not, uh, not up to it. I mean, it's, it's, it's below expectations, not really as good as we were promised. Or maybe they're scared of the military superiority or any superiority that the Canaanites might have. That's why Hashem says, Anina said, I'm doing the giving. I'm not a king, queen, I'm not a king. I'm the Melech Malchi Amlochim, I'm the king of kings. Could I give you a shmata land? You're worried about it's not up to scratch, not the standard? Could I give you? And who are you? B'ni B'chari Yisrael. The apostle says, you're my firstborn son. Could a father give his, his the apple of his eye, his favorite son, a shmata gift? You're B'ni B'chari. So uh, why are you worried? Oh, you're worried that maybe they're more powerful than you? I mean, I'm saying, I'm giving it to you. I made everything. I own everything. I control everything. Even if you've got bows and arrows and they've got nuclear bombs, I'm still going to give it to you. So what are you scared about? What are you scared about? So that is certainly an indication that at the very beginning of the, of the story, the Jewish people were, were scared. More than that. The answer, says the Qasim Cipher, is why they were scared. They were scared after all the land of Israel had been promised to the by Hashem, to Avram, to Yitzchak, to Yaakov, to Moshe. So what are they worried about? And the answer, says the Qasim Cipher, is they're scared because since Hashem had promised it to Avram, to Yitzchak, to Yaakov, to Moshe, they've, they've done something wrong. They'd made a golden calf. They'd made a golden calf, and when they'd made a golden calf, that convinced them that their sins were so bad, or their sin had been so bad, that Hashem no longer was going to give it to them. He could, of course. They didn't doubt that Hashem could give it to them. These are the people that go through the Yamsuf. But would he give it? Did they deserve it? If you no longer believe in yourself, then you're in trouble. Then you're easy meat for your enemy. Any army walking onto a battlefield convinced they're going to lose, are going to lose. So the Jewish people, now doubting themselves, are going to lose. Let me take you to Rabbi Dessler. Rabbi Dessler and Mixed Million Kelly Gimel, uh, and this is in page uh, 156. Now, this is a, a quite a long essay, uh, worthy of a lot more than dipping into, which I'm going to do now for our purposes. But uh, Kelly Gimel, page 156, have you got a Mixed Million on? And don't you? There's Rabbi Miller, Sagatzali Vrocha, one of Rabbi Dessel, the most devoted to medium, the famous to medium, the head of Gates at Girls Seminary, used to say to the girls, Do you have a mixed million? Yes. Good. But the one said no, he would say, Do you have a second pair of shoes? Uh, that's how essential Rabbi Miller felt mixed million was. And I would second that. Um, anyway, let me read to you what Rabbi Dessel says here, and it goes beautifully with what we said from the Kotzka Rebbe, from the art school, at the beginning, that the crime was seeing themselves through others' eyes. 
and particularly through our enemy's eyes. So listen, uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting, intriguing piece to, to read to you. It's only two little paragraphs, so don't worry too much. Let me tell you a secret about this, of, of the concept of Golas, when the Jewish people are exiled amongst other nations. That never really was the effect. That was the case that the exile affected the intrinsic and basic nature of the Jewish people. Not permanently, not forever. Of course, there would be people would drop out along the way, but Cloud Israel as an entity still would be able to re emerge and survive. Because what they did and what they offered those, those exilers uh, would never ultimately get. To what a Jew is and corrupts it completely. Even if it would be the case, and you can see this all the way through Jewish history from our Bible and all the way through the, the Talmudic period, etc., even if the Jewish people interacted with non Jewish societies uh, and indeed seemed to speak the same language as non Jewish societies, understood the, uh, the societal icons uh, and the culture. That didn't mean to say that they valued it, that they valued it. Um, it didn't affect them. Going back to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, etc., in the earlier generation, they saw that their interactions or the fact that they were in exile was because God wanted them to be there in order to um, correct whatever mistakes had led them to be exiled in the first place. But not ultimate, but they didn't ultimately value the the the, the gods, the ideals um, of the nations amongst whom they were they were exiled amongst. Those who engaged in idolatry, um, the Babylonians are indeed the Greeks. The core, the core of the Jewish people remained intact uh, and did not value, did not admire. In fact, saw right through those transient, ephemeral isms that would last for 50 years or 100 years or whatever, and then disappear, as they all do. And the sophistication of their culture, their beautiful buildings, their, their, their huge economies, their fortunes, ultimately the Jews, the Jewish people, those who survived and weren't eroded, which was the core, but they didn't see that as being worthwhile at all. And that's critical for what we're saying. And at no point were ultimately the Jewish people corrupted and destroyed by those values outside. And of course, we're talking naturally, we're talking about Jews who remained focused on what the Torah said and kept a relationship with the Torah. And obviously God, the ones who abandoned that, of course, were going to be classic, the classic um, melting pot and assimilation and some assimilated uh, or assimilationists. Oh, that's says Rabbi Best, the quickly qualifying. So you think, what's he talking about? I didn't Millions get assimilated. I'm talking about the very early generations. Um, but later generations, our generation. Um, when our own self-value became diminished and devalued in our own eyes, and by definition, the values of the outside world suddenly became cherished and important, then um, then it came that the Jewish people thought that all the values and all the, the, the canon of whatever ism was dominant in the world at any particular time, those values, those ideals, those norms, that then became something which Jewish people valued. Um, and they wanted very much to, to copy and, and copy that. And it was extremely difficult then for us to bear the exile that we were part of when the values of that exile were ones in which we uh, agreed were great, but were usually precluded from being part of. 
יש אותו לראות בגישה זו כביכול הרומס קומה וישרום. This, they would see that by joining in this, uh, these societies, that that would be a great thing for the Jewish people to do. And they thought, that, you know, if we could just become good German citizens, British citizens, and good Americans, um, then everybody would think, wow, how wonderful we are. We've, we've made it. We are Americans. <laughs> quite the opposite. And says Rabbi Dessa, Abba Emmet he the Gamma Lehip is quite the con the opposite. Arishani Mahoya Gadoli Ruach Maoid. The people, the, the early founders of the Jewish people, Abram Yitzchak and Yaakov, etc., then they were of such great stature. The Jews who abandoned them and look back at our history and think that this is that we were primitive, our values were medieval or even before medieval and useless. Uh, values of antiquity with no modern relevance whatsoever uh, and look to the future and these new, the dominant uh, philosophy of whatever society they lived in, uh, they were making a big mistake. The, it was those great people, their values, which were uh, immortal and would keep us going. Uh, it never occurred to them for one second to be impressed by money or immorality or all these things and here we go rack i've underlined this twice rack only only when we fell in our connection and our value of ourselves and our belief and pride in who and what we were then is god even then then that caused our enemies to grow and then they had an ultimate contempt for us and then that's when the golas, the eggs are really bites. And indeed, uh, German Jews, who so much strove to be German, um, when Germany turned around, and what we know what happened uh, with something called Hitler, uh, then the values that they so valued, the, the culture of German society, the Spitzkultur, the zenith of human culture, turned out to be the not a zenith, but in actual fact, the pit of human, of human barbarity. And they hate us when we do abandon our Jewishness. That's precisely what the Posuk says, our Posuk. And we saw ourselves as being bugs and grasshoppers. And that's when they saw us like that as well. When we saw ourselves as worthless and our society as worthless, when, go back to that quote from either Will or Ariel um, Durant, Durant, no society is destroyed from without until it's first destroyed itself from within. I recall many years ago when I was a certain chaplain for Liverpool University and all the other universities of the Northwest of England, they came to Sukkot and it was freshers or freshmen, they say in America, but freshers week when huge halls are filled with every society advocating every sort of activity or belief you could possibly imagine, witchcraft, um, scuba diving, I joined that one, uh, and various others. And I remember uh, I walked, because it was Sukkot that particular year I'm, I'm recalling, with my Lulav and my Esrog over to the Jewish society. I hadn't seen my students for a uh, long summer break. And there I walked in um, looking more or less exact as I do um, now with my white shirt and dark blue uh, suit. Very, very radical. Other people are dressed like, you know, in medieval costumes. People were staring at me with my pan branch and my lemon. And I walked towards the Jewish society table. As I walked there, my students saw me and they liked me and I, uh, they were waving at me, why, why? Uh, and then they saw that I was carrying a pan branch and a lemon and you could see them looking very embarrassed. So I went over to them and asked them what they'd been doing with their summer vacation and they all, told me where they'd been to, you know, Bangkok and Australia and Tokyo and all sorts of interesting places. I went to Scotland, which I love, but wasn't quite as exotic. And, and then after I got all the, all the news and I said, hey, would you like to take the Lulav and the Estro and give it a shake? And they were so embarrassed. Now, because the, st the stalls were set up alphabetically, the Jewish society stall, 
was next to the Islamic Society store, IG. And in those days, anyway, the Islamic Society and Liverpool University and the Jewish societies and myself, indeed, got on extremely well. I was invited for about five years in a row to address Islam Awareness Week. So there you go. Um, anyway, so they were so embarrassed they wouldn't take this. But there's a fellow there who I seem to remember his name was Muhammad al Assad. And uh, I think it was Pakistani. Um, very nice fellow. He looked over and he looked at them and said, why don't you talk to Why don't you take your thing? Why don't you take your thing? It's your religion. Take it and give it a shake. Don't be embarrassed. It's your belief. Take it and give it a shake. And these non-Jewish, uh, sorry, these Jewish children took this non-Jewish fellow, this Muslim fellow, and they took the little of an ass and gave it a shake. shake. They wouldn't do it for Rabbi Baba Rubenstein, but they would do it for Muhammad al Assad. And the interesting thing is that Muslims are extremely unembarrassed about their belief. And people admire them for it. Um, and so they should with us. It's when we don't believe in ourselves, when we see ourselves as Hagavi. I think Rabbi Fran's making a very important point here, and it's one that Rabbi Destin says um, more fully, and that is when you allow people's view of you to become your view of you, then that's when you're in trouble. As we start with the Kotzka Rebbe, let's finish the point. The Kotzka Rebbe famously said, if I am I and you are you, then I am I and you are you. But if I'm I because you are you, and you are you because I'm I, then I'm not I and you're not you. Now, I usually have to repeat that, but you can repeat it yourself. The point is that if I am I because you are you, or you are you, in other words, I'm only I because I'm reflecting you. If non-Jewish society is what I am, and I'm only I because of you, then I'm not I at all. I'm only a mirror of you. But in the same way, the other way around, you be you and I'll be me. But if we can only just be ourselves and proud of who and what we are, proud of that self, had they been proud of that self? according to the Kotzka Rebbe, according to the Elshif, and everybody else. That wouldn't have been the second most dramatic failure in the history of Klaal And there's an important lesson to take there. I wish you all a very, very good week. A wonderful Shabbos, a good week. And hopefully when I see you next week, I'll be able to report, please God, uh, ongoing success for Rafael Chaim ben Sara and for Uriah Chaim uh, uh, ben Chani Yehudis. Um, that he's had that transplant and everything has gone well. And for everybody you're dabbing for, the whole class role should have a refresh lemma. See you next week.